We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start off with verse 13. And we're going to go to verse 19. As I was studying this, this uh, really convicted me. So, if anything, I'll be standing up here preaching to myself because I need to hear this over and over and over again. Uh, it's a message that I needed big time. So I'm praying and hoping that someone else will be encouraged and be challenged by this as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the verses and then I'll pray and we'll get started, okay? So if you're there in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, if you have a freeway Bible, if you want to uh, say the page number of the freeway Bible, 841. All right. For everyone there, say amen. Alright, here we go. It says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who calls you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you, God, that just for your word, I want to thank you for salvation. Thank you, God, for what Jesus has done for all of us on the cross, his atoning work. We know, Lord, that this society is messed up right now. There's a lot of people in this room that I feel that are struggling. I pray, Lord, through your word, through your Holy Spirit, that you would help them, encourage them, challenge them. I pray for people to get saved tonight. And I pray, God, that you would just protect us tonight, Lord. We live in an evil world, and we need to know how to live as Christians, God. So I pray that you would help show us that tonight. Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, so today in America, we live in very uncertain times. Just this past week alone, there's bombings at the Instable Airport. 36 people dead. 147 people injured. I saw a report last night on my phone that hostages are being held in a cafe by six gunmen who claim to be from ISIS. 20 people dead. Earlier last month, at a gay nightclub, a man who, came, who claimed to be with ISIS marched into the nightclub, killed 50 people, and over 50 plus more people injured. ISIS is on the rise, our society as a whole has fallen. Our government, who used to call good, good, and evil, evil, is now calling good, evil, and evil, good. We live in a broken society, and I really believe, truly, that we're living in the last days. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 says this, But know this, that in the last days, fearless times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, 
and from such people turn away. This stuff is becoming more and more evident every single day. This is the time that we live in right now. I did a, I did a research, I was researching online, and I looked up this website that had a bunch of facts. I'm gonna name some of these facts and share some of these facts with you guys. When I was reading these, I, was, I started crying, this is terrible. Listen to some of these. According to the US Census Bureau, the number of Americans with no religion more than doubled between 1990 and 2008. A study conducted by the Barna Group discovered that nearly 60% of all Christians from ages 15 to 29 years of age are no longer actively involved in church. And then we start getting into the drugs. The number of heroin-related overdose deaths, listen to this, has risen 84% just since 2010. America is the highest rate of illegal drug use in the entire planet. An all-time high of 59% of all Americans believe that the traditional definition of marriage needs to be changed. And the list just keeps going on and on and on and on. See, don't you see? We live in a society that's evil, that's wicked, that's corrupt. People that really don't give a rip about who God is. Don't show him any respect at all. People that started out being Christian and going to church and now being fall away because they're getting lured by the world into temptation. Not being involved in church anymore. But this is it. This is what we live in. This is the society we live in. This is real life. This is true. Billy Graham said this. Our society strives to avoid any possibility of offending anyone except God. So the question is, tonight, if you're a Christian, how do we live in this society? How do we live in a, in a broken, fallen society, a broken world? How is a Christian supposed to respond to these types of things? How are they supposed to respond to temptation? How are they supposed to respond to society and the wickedness and the corruption in this day? Tonight, we're gonna, I'm going to give you guys three principles that we're going to find through this text, through this book of 1 Peter, that are going to show how to live in Christian life in the fallen world. Three principles. The first one is living your life with hope. The second one is living your life with holiness. And the third one is living your life with a reverent fear of God. So first, live your life with hope. If you look at verse 13... Therefore, that first word is extremely important. A lot of people can pass over that word, but it's extremely important. Peter is saying, because of everything that I mentioned in verses 1 through 12, therefore, do this. And he's saying, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the first command in 13 verses. The first thing Peter tells us to do is hope. The main verb of this verse is hope, or to rest your hope. Girding up the loins of your mind and being sober are what they call participles, which modify the main verb, which is hope. So the first thing that Peter tells us to do, the first command that he gives us is to hope, and to rest our hope in the grace Fully. To hope in grace. That's the point of that verse. So what's the grace? It's all, it's the, all the grace of God that Peter was talking about in verses 1 through 12. So turn your page back and go back to the first verse. Let's recap this real quick. So because, verse 2, or in some translations, verse 1, because you are elect, or because you were called, and God has chosen you. Because, verse 3, God, He is merciful, and He has caused you to be born again to a living hope. Because, verse 4, He is keeping an inheritance for you that is incorruptible, undefiled, that doesn't fade away, and is reserved for you. Because, verse 5, He is protecting and keeping you through faith so that you won't lose that inheritance. 
Because verses 6 through 7 is refining and purifying you through fire and trials so that you be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because verse 8, even though you do not see him, you can believe and have joy and inexpressible because you are able to rejoice. Because verses 10 through 12, the prophets inquired and searched carefully about this grace that has now come to us that even angels desire to look into. So what he's saying is because all of these things, because verses 1 through 12, because all the grace that I'm telling you about right now about salvation, because therefore, hope in it. Rest your hope in it. Because of the grace, hope in it. He says rest your hope fully in the grace. God doesn't want 25%, 50%, or 90% hope. He wants you to hope fully in Him, in the grace. He doesn't want lukewarm, half-hearted hopers. He wants you to be fully hope in God, both 100%, hope in the grace that He has given us. If you notice, it, doesn't, it says God has done this. God, because of God, because of His mercy. Because of his inheritance that he's given us. Because of what? God, 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 God. And therefore, it doesn't say work. It says, therefore, rest. Rest your hope in it fully. That's the first command. To rest your hope fully in it. When Jesus Christ comes back. And he stands up off his throne. And he splits open the sky. And he comes back to this earth to make all things right. To eradicate sin once and for all. To take his people back so they can be with eternity with him and praise him in heaven forever. That's what we rest our hope in. We don't rest our hope in our emotions, in our circumstances, in our wife, in our husband, girlfriend, boyfriend. We don't rest our hope in any of that. We should rest our hope fully grace and keeping our eyes focused on that. So you might say, how do we even do that? You say, rest your hope, well, how do I rest my hope in it? By girding up the loins of your mind. By girding up the loins of your mind. Warren Wiersbe said this, a Christian who is looking for the glory of God has a greater motivation for present obedience than a Christian who ignores the Lord's return. See, girding up the loins of your mind means to have a disciplined mind. In ancient times, what they would do is they would wear these tunics, which are basically long robes. And whenever men would go into war or go into battle and have to go to work, what they would do is they would take the loose ends of these tunics and of these robes and they would tuck them into their belts. If they failed to do this, it was a hindrance to them. Sometimes it was actually dangerous. They could die. They couldn't freely move. It caused them sometimes to trip and fall. It was in ancient days, it was basically a way of saying, man up, prepare yourself, get ready. If Jesus was to come back tonight, are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you prepared to meet the creator of the universe? Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25. You can go there if you want, if not, that's okay. Listen to this. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. If I skip down to verse 3, it says, Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and tricked their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And why? And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Listen, and those who 
were ready, went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And if you skip down a couple verses, it says in verse 13, watch, therefore. That means be prepared. Be watchful. Be ready. Listen, there's ten virgins. They all knew that the bridegroom was coming. They all were waiting for him. Only half were ready. Only half were prepared. What are you doing tonight to prepare yourself for the coming of the Lord? Peter is saying here that we need to pull in the loose ends of our minds, reject the hindrances of this world so we can focus freely on Him. Pray. Read your Bibles. Study your Bible. Be disciplined. Get disciple. Serve God. Rejecting the hindrances of this world. What's, what's hindering you from your walk with God right now? If you're a Christian, what has taken the place of the hope that you fully put in Jesus Christ whenever you first got saved? What's changed since then? And then he tells us to be sober-minded. To gird up the loins of our mind, and he says to be sober-minded. Which means to be self-controlled. Peter uses the same word in 1 Peter 5, chapter 5, verse 8, and he says, Be sober and vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking to be made about. Being sober means to have a clear mind. Have you ever been driving your car, and your defroster doesn't work, and your windshield starts to get foggy, and the small things that you are able to see before, you can't see anymore? So you get real close to your windshield, you're, you're on your screen like this, and you swing your eyes, and it's like, what's going on? What is that? Right? That's what your life is like whenever you're clouding your mind with drugs. That's what life is like whenever you're living in unrepentant sin. It starts from your peripheral vision, and if things start getting cloudy, the things that you're able to see so clearly before aren't so clear anymore. Until you, before you know it, it's completely cloudy and you can't see anything spiritual anymore. Because you're living in an unrepentant sin. But you know what? If you're living that foggy life right now, if you're living in sin, in that foggy sin, there's someone that can fix your defroster. It's Jesus Christ. Hey, is your defroster broken? If your defroster is broken, Jesus Christ can fix it. He can give you a new slate. He can enlighten your eyes. You can see light now for what it really is, what it truly means. See, the Bible calls us to have a clear mind, to be sharp, and to be prepared. So to rightfully rest our hope in the grace, we need to gird up the loins of our minds. We need to be sober-minded, self-controlled, clear minds. And secondly, we need to live a life in holiness. Verse 14 says, As, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. First, to live a life in holiness, we have to go and look at the holiness of God himself. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 2 says this, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. God is holy. He is holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with His glory, says the prophet Isaiah. He is completely without sin. He is absolutely perfect. He's high above any other, and we cannot ever reach His holiness. He's perfect. There might be some people in here tonight that have been trying to work hard to have an exterior holiness. And you might come to church, you might come to freeway, you might go to a Bible study maybe, you might be going through some treatment program, but you're doing it because you want everyone else around you to think that you're doing good. But really, deep down inside, you're still hurt. 
and you're still broken. And you're about this close to giving up. Let me tell you something tonight. You can never personally get your own holiness. Holiness will never come from yourself. It doesn't come from yourself. It doesn't come from the Pope. It doesn't come from the church. It doesn't come from water. Holy water. There's no such thing. Holiness only comes from God and God alone. And if you've been trying to work for your salvation, can I invite you to come tonight and come down to the altar and cry in front of the holy God and say, God, I give up. I can't do my own no more. I need your strength. I need your power. I need Jesus. If that's you tonight, if you've been working and you're tired, tired of working so hard, will you commit to doing that tonight? And coming down here and giving up, letting the Lord take over your life. If we're just doing ministry and serving God in our own power, we're just doing empty religion. That's all it is. So what's Peter saying here, right? To be absolutely perfect? No one can compare to God, so how are we supposed to be holy like he's holy? Well, look what it says in the verse. He says, but as he who has called you, he has called us. He might be calling some people right now in this crowd. Whatever he called Peter, he said, Peter, come, and I will make you fishers of men. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And Peter obeyed by faith, and it completely changed his life forever. I remember when God called me. I was at my buddy's house. All alone, it was 3 a.m. in the morning, and I am weeping. On my knees. I'm listening to a three-way podcast online. And God has reached through that podcast that I'm listening to online and has broken me. And I'm weeping on my knees and I just gave up. I said, Lord, I can't do this no more. Right then I committed my life to Him. Following Him. Following His Word. And He's, throughout the time of the two and a half years that I've been saved, God has, through my obedience, more and more I've been obedient to Him, He's continuously set me apart more and more and more. He's given me new desires. He's given me a new family. He's given me a new hope. He's given me new people, new people to be surrounded by. And that's what it's talking about. When someone gets saved, positionally, they are automatically holy. Positionally in their relationship with God. But we are to practice holiness every single day in our daily life. Listen to what it says in Colossians 1.22. It says that you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, that's what he sees you as. He looks at me and he sees the son. He doesn't see the wickedness that I've done in the past. He sees the son of Jesus Christ. Like I said, we are to practice holiness. True salvation results in obedience. An attitude of obedience is a characteristic of God's children. Look what he says. He says, as obedient children. That word obedient literally means submissive. So as submissive, obedient children, not conforming to their lust, their former lust is in your ignorance. When you conform yourself to the world, when you go back to your old way, you're misrepresenting the one that's inside you. You're misrepresenting Christ. And to a fallen society, what do they see? What kind of Jesus do they see? Some of you guys in this room have habits, the way that you speak, the way that you act, mannerisms maybe, the things that you do, the people that you hang around with, that look exactly like the world. A world 
that you said that you've been redeemed from. And some of you still act that way. And you come in here and you listen to the preacher, or you listen to John, or whoever's up here, you say, Amen, preacher! And you walk out the doors with hatred, and jealousy, and bitterness in your heart. And you're cussing. The things that are coming out of your mouth. Amen? Look, with the fall of godless society that we live in right now, we don't need no more half-hearted Christians that are unloving, that aren't fully sold out. We need men and women of God. People that are going to stand up for the Word of God. And people that are going to kill their flesh daily. People are going to walk out these doors and have Jesus Christ be shining through them so they can have make a difference in their families, in their homes, in this city, in this country, in this world. We need people that are sold out for Jesus Christ and really show society who Jesus really is and show people that we care about them, that we love them. That's what we need. We need to be following the Word of God. Peter was quoting the Old Testament out of Leviticus 19.2, which says, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In that time, God was calling the whole nation of Israel to be set apart from the other nations so that the other nations can see them and realize that they are called by God, that they are set apart, that they aren't like everyone else, they aren't like the rest of the world. And that's what holiness means, to be set apart. So what he's saying here is to be holy as God is holy, he's saying that we need to be set apart from the world. We need to be set apart from our former selves. We need to be set apart in everything that we do and be set apart to the Bible. It's exactly what Paul said in Romans 1.1. Be set apart to the gospel. That's exactly what we need. I don't know if uh, we need to be examples, man. Really, for real. I don't know if it, I don't even have children. But if you're a parent and you have children, what example are you showing your kids? Right? Would you want your kids to become exactly like you? And if not, then what are you doing to change that? If you think our society is bad now, how much worse is our society going to be if we're not taking the responsibility right now to invest in the younger generation and to invest in the kids? Who's going to be taking our place whenever we die? It's, I mean, if we say, man, the world's looking terrible right now, what's it really going to be like? We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to be examples. And we need to be examples daily and live a set apart holy life. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Be imitators of God as beloved children. So to live our life, we need to. In a fallen society, we need to be living our life with hope. We need to be living our life with holiness. And we need to be living our life with a reverent fear of God. Look at verse 17. It says, If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. So what is the fear of God? For an unbeliever, the fear of God is eternal judgment. For the unbeliever, the fear of God is being completely separated from Him for eternity. But as a Christian, it means something completely different. As a Christian, it means reverence, deep, deep respect for a holy God. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 2, 1 through 5 says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. See, the fear of God is to take God seriously. That means you're more concerned about what God says than what your friends say. 
You're more concerned about what God says than your neighbor, your checkbook, how much money you have. Fearing God is taking God seriously. Taking Him seriously for His Word. If we ever want a revival in this city or in this country, we need to draw a circle around ourselves and live a holy life and fear God. And live a life that's, fear, that's a reverent fear of God. And we need to look at ourselves. We need to take Him seriously because He's our Father and our Judge. If you look at verse 17, it's pretty interesting that He says that He calls God our Father and our Judge. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, He's not going to judge your sin twice. That's already done with the cross. But He is a Judge of the works and what we do here on our time on earth. The Bible says we're saved for good works and to glorify Him. The judgment Peter is talking about here is the judgment seat of Christ. This is where each Christian will give an account for their works done here on earth, and each one will receive their proper reward. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse, verse 5, it states that God will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the motives of the heart. What do you do if, what, what you do for God? What are you really doing it for? What's your true motive? Are you doing it for selfish ambition? Are you seriously doing it because you want to see people come to Christ? You want to see people's lives change. You want to see a revival in this country, in this city, in yourself. What's your motive? And it's because of this that he says, conduct yourselves through your time of your stay here in fear. Don't spend all your time and your talents and your treasures on earth for yourself. Lay up for your treasures in heaven, says the Bible. Right? They won't be destroyed. And we take him seriously because he, he paid everything for us. Look at verse 18. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The word redeemed means to ransom, to buy back someone from bondage by the payment of a price. It means to be set free by paying a ransom. Redemption was a technical term for money that was paid back to buy a prisoner of war or a slave. In this context, what it's showing right now in, this, in these verses, it's saying that it is used to show the price that was paid to buy back the freedom of someone that was in bondage to sin. Amen. The price that was paid to a holy God was the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. He was perfect, sinless. He was the only one that was going to be, that was going to satisfy the wrath of God. And He willingly, lovingly, went to the cross to die for your sins, to die for my sins, and to give us life. He died so He could give you life and me life. Today, people try to redeem themselves with the world. They try to find redemption in money and the things of this world. We can't find redemption in money. Listen to this. If you were to try, if you try to redeem yourself in the world, and try to redeem yourself out of slavery through the world, you're always going to be in slavery. You're always going to be in bondage. You were bought with a price of Jesus Christ. He bought you. And it says because of this, because of what Jesus has done, because of the cost of salvation, throughout your time here, live in fear of Him. It doesn't matter what society says, what your friends say, you take a stand for God. I'm going to give an illustration, and I'm going to close with this. But suppose you were a dad, and you had a 17-year-old daughter, and she was starting to become a problem. And she's hanging around, you see her hanging around the wrong people. She's not really involved in spiritual things. 
anymore like she used to be. She doesn't care about that anymore. But you love her to death. And you die for her in a heartbeat. But one day she gets kidnapped. And the people that are kidnapping her, or kidnapped her, sent you a letter for a ransom that you'd have to pay to get her back. So you decide you're going to do it. But you don't have the money. So you sell your house, you sell your car, you sell your jewelry, your wife's wedding ring, anything that's valuable to you, you sell. And you have this money, and you bring it, and they, and they set up a spot, a place, a certain place where you can bring the money, where your daughter can see it, they can see it, and you can see it. And they set it up where the daughter will come, pick the money up, bring it over to the kidnappers, and then she'll be free. So what you do is you bring the money, you set it in the place, and you sit there and wait. And then you see your daughter come. And she takes the money. Now she's walking away to bring it to the people that have kidnapped her. She turns around, gives you the finger, puts her arm around the kidnapper, and walks off. That's what you should be afraid of. Doing that. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear because he paid everything for you. He gave everything. He gave it all for you. Conduct yourselves with fear and respect for Him. That's what this is saying. Don't live a lifestyle that represents Christ as worthless to you. He gave it all on the line. Jesus Christ was beaten and whipped and spit on. They put a robe over Him and beat Him in the face and said, prophesy who hit you. And he willingly went to the cross when he was a deep, bloody mess and got nailed to the cross for you and died for you. So don't live your life like that's worthless. That's infinite value. No amount of money can, can ever pay that cost of our sin debt. So are you that daughter or son tonight? Are you the one that's walking away from the love of the Father? If you are, I invite you to come back to him. Because He loves you. And He will forgive you. And He wants to change you. And make you into a person that's going to be an example to this fallen society. So they can see what the true Christ really looks like. Can you bow your heads with me please? God, thank you. Thank you for your son. Jesus paid everything for us. There might be some people in here that don't know you at all. Maybe there's some people in here that through this sermon was being described as people that are living a life that think that Jesus Christ is worthless to them. Maybe there's some people in here that have backslidden. God, I pray that you would move. Give them strength and liberty, God, to come down here and give up. Give it all to you. I pray for Mike as he comes the second half and preaches what's on his heart. I thank you, God, for an opportunity to share your word. Thank you for what you've done in my life and the people who've changed me here, Lord. Thank you, God, for Freeway. And I pray this night that you can Glory, we will praise you in Jesus' name. Take a 15-minute break and come back to the second half. Thank you.